the one change I would make that I think would have the biggest impact on society would be that everyone should have friends who are different from them. And so um, one way to get into this is if you, if you think for yourself, did I or did I not go to, univers- go to university? And if you think of most of your friends and whether they did or didn't, now, I would push that probably you've come up with the same answer. If you've said, I did, then probably most of your friends did. If you said, I didn't, then probably most of your friends didn't. If I said, okay, did you grow up in a house or a flat? Okay, well, did most of your friends grow up in a house or a flat? I would reckon you've probably got the same answer. If I ask you whether your parents or your parent, whether they mostly worked or whether they were unemployed, and if I ask you to think of most of your friends, you probably again get the same answer. The, the country is full of these invisible dividing lines. We know people who are like us. We tend to agree with our friends. We therefore think everyone else is crazy. I, um, I, when I left university, I went to work in the east end of London, a place called Canning Town, which is quite, it's a wonderful place, but it's quite deprived. And I got to know a guy there called Billy, who was uh, probably in his uh, early 50s, and he'd lived there all his life. And one weekend I went to a, a park called the Thames Barrier Park, which is a beautiful, beautiful park. It was done over by the, the, the Labour government, and it looks absolutely extraordinary. And I, I went there for the weekend. Hardly anyone there. Beautiful. And I said to Billy on, after the weekend, I said, have you ever been? And he looked me in the eye, Billy, who'd lived there for, as I say, 30, 40 years. No, I've never been. And I said, why not? He said, it's not for the likes of us. I said, what do you mean? He didn't say, I don't know how to get there. He didn't say, I don't like parks. He didn't say, I was busy. He didn't say, it wasn't a very nice day. He said, it's not for the likes of us. And the country is full of these invisible dividing lines. We look at things and think, well, that's not for me. And if you don't agree with me, if you don't know that experience, I challenge you, if you've never been into a betting shop, go into a betting shop. I challenge you, if you've never been to a church, go into a church. If you've never been to a mosque, go to a mosque and feel that feeling in your stomach that says, I don't know if I'm meant to be here. Now, we want to do something about that. We set up a a charity three years ago called The Challenge Network. The mission of The Challenge Network is that everyone will have friends who are different from them. It doesn't mean that all your friends have to be different. You often want to hang out with people who have the same interests as you, but no one should get to the age of 18 without meeting people who are poorer than them, richer than them, more educated than them, less educated than them, whiter than them, blacker than them, more Asian than them, less Asian than them. You shouldn't be able to grow up in this country without having friends who are different. And the question for me is, why? Why does this matter? Three things. Short things, but they make a massive difference. One is well-being. Like, the, the country has got, it feels pretty poor at the moment, but actually we're twice as rich as we were 50 years ago. We've got twice as much money to spend. But what's happened to well-being? It's flatlined. We've had twice the amount of money and our well-being, our happiness, our general sense of my life is good has flatlined. It, I work for an, an organisation, if I get twice the amount of money to spend and I deliver the same amount, the same result, what happens to me is I get fired. Something is massively not working. We've doubled the amount of money and flatlined our, our happiness. It's because we feel this sense of not a, a lack of attachment, a lack of friendship, a lack of... Everything says that well-being is linked to our relationships. And too many of young people grow up detached, cut off in these invisible dividing lines. So one is well-being. The second is about responsibility. We saw just six months ago, in a very extreme way with, the, with some of the riots that took place in 2011, that sense of actually I don't feel attached. Too many of people feel a lack of attachment. And what happens is they blame other people for the problems. You, you, heard, you heard it just last year. It's the chaps. It's the rich who don't pay enough taxes. It's the blacks. It's the whites. It's the Asians. This sense of blame reduces our ability to take responsibility but one thing cuts through. It cuts through on blame. It's very, very hard to blame a friend. If you've got a friend who's white, who's black, who's Asian, who's rich or poor, suddenly it's a bit harder to say, actually, it's all those people, because actually you know someone. Well-being matters. Friendship drives well-being. Friendship drives responsibility. It also drives our young people. Our young people have the lowest, the lowest level of happiness anywhere amongst the 21st, 21 richest countries in Europe, and that's about relationships. When you ask them how good their relationships are with their peers, they say it's the worst in all those 21 countries. If we're not going to give our young people the chance to build friendships with people who are different from them, we have no chance of changing that, no matter how much money we throw at the problem. One thing I would change, relationships. People need to have friendships with people who are different. We have a saying here that says that change doesn't come from on top, it comes from people. It comes from people coming together. But to do that, first of all, you've got to bring people together. That's what we're here to do.